Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk, Real-Time Adaptive Controls for Resilient Distributed Systems. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? And right after lunch. <laughs> I'll try my best to not put you guys to sleep, but no promises. So this is what I'm going to cover in my talk today. I'll start discussing the need for real-time adaptive controls. I'll introduce a reference architecture using which I drive the rest of the talk. I'll briefly discuss few adaptive controls that we are successfully running in our production environment, give a quick sneak peek of what we are currently working on, and summarize it all at the end. There is a lot to cover here, so let's get going. Before we go and talk about adaptive controls, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Praveen, I am a husband, I'm a father to a lovely six-year-old. I am originally from India, and I call Melbourne home now. I'd like to call myself a distributed systems engineer. I've moved to a leadership role not so long ago, and I'm loving the opportunity to grow as a leader. I am an active open source contributor, and I contributed to projects like uh, Kubernetes, Terraform, Grafana, Firecracker, etc. I am passionate about distributed systems, resiliency engineering, and FinOps. If you like to chat about any of these topics, I would love to. I work for CrowdStrike. If you are not aware of CrowdStrike, uh, we are the company behind the amazing Falcon platform. Falcon is the first cloud-native platform protecting endpoints like your laptops, servers, mobile phones, cloud workloads, identity and data workloads, etc. I manage the SRE team here in APAC and we are responsible for availability, latency, performance, and capacity of the large-scale distributed systems that power these amazing products. <laughs> now, just to put things into perspective, here are some of the stats that speak for the complexities of the challenges that my team face on a daily basis. Our platform communicates with 50 million peak concurrent agents, which are deployed all over the world, pretty much and handle slightly more than two trillion events per day on an average that come from these agents into our platform. So why do we need real-time adaptive controls? As the microservices gain more and more popularity, building for and deploying on the distributed architectures is becoming the de facto standard for many applications today. A direct consequence of this is the explosion of configuration surface for these workloads. So much of this configuration inc include tunables like circuit breakers, worker pool sizes, auto-scaling policies, throttlers, what have you. And these components directly affect the service resiliency. Finding ideal initial values for these tunables require deep technical expertise. Also, the problem is these workloads change over time requiring regular effort to retune these tail parameters. And as a consequence, configuration errors have become a source of toil and major cause for overload and cascading failures across the industry. We wanted to do better than static configurations where we can. So we sought to automatically identify a system's inherent ideal configuration in a way that it would require no manual work, requires no centralized coordination, infer the limit without any knowledge of the hardware or system topology, adapt to changes in system topology, and easy to compute and enforce, of course. To make the discussion in this talk a bit more concrete, let me introduce a reference architecture and drive the rest of the talk using the workloads from this architecture. There are two services in our reference architecture. First, a writer service. This service reads messages from a message bus like Kafka, transforms the data and writes to a data store like Cassandra. Uh, the actual technologies are not really relevant here, and we can apply the same principles that we're going to discuss today to many other technologies, and not just these two. And second, we have a reader service that exposes an API interface using which the clients can make queries and read data from this persistent store. Very simple. Now let's talk about various controls that are in place to make these services more resilient. We will discuss the challenges uh, with the traditional static controls by going through example scenarios and conclude by introducing the adaptive variants for each of these controls. 
Let's start with a very simple control, circuit breakers. A circuit breaker acts as a proxy for operations that might fail. The proxy should monitor the number of recent failures that have occurred and use this information to basically protect our systems by deciding whether to allow a particular operation at that point in time or simply return failure or take some other corrective action. In the context of writer service, a very simple implementation of a circuit breaker could look like this. We have, let's say, a token bucket that gets filled every two minutes. When the writer service encounters a failure, it consumes one of the tokens from this failure bucket. And if there are no tokens left, it opens the circuit. And it starts rejecting messages at that point. And the circuit will be closed once the bucket is refilled and it goes on and on. This control is very simple to understand, easy to maintain, but presents some interesting challenges that might come with scale. Now imagine this writer service handling multiple tens of millions of writes per second. Little fun fact here, we actually run a service in our production that resembles this writer service, and it handles around 85 million requests per second on average. At that scale, it is very easy to hit the limits of technologies like Kafka or Cassandra, et cetera. And this is where I think cell-based architecture really shines and help us scale beyond the limits imposed by these underlying technologies and limit blast radius in case of failures. The idea behind the cells is very, very simple. Each cell is an exact functional replica of each other. And the request set is sharded over these cells based on some sharding strategy. Coming back to, our, to the drawbacks of our simplistic uh, circuit breaker, I think the problem here is twofold. First, the traffic distribution could be uneven among these cells for various reasons. Maybe we have one cell that is bigger than the other. Maybe we have cells uh, that are undergoing maintenance. And two, the traffic distribution could be dynamic. We might add new traffic, and we might redirect existing traffic from one cell to another. So configuring the right amount of failure tokens will slowly turn into an operational nightmare and could easily cause problems if it is either over-configured or under-configured. So how do we solve this? We can make this adaptive simply by changing the circuit logic. Uh, instead of using a token bucket, we use a percentage threshold circuit breaker. And just by doing that, we are adapting to the traffic size here. And irrespective of how many cells you may have in your production and how different they are from each other, now we have single standard failure threshold after which we can open the circuit. This simple uh, technique might sound like uh, just common sense, right? Because it really is. But I include this in my talk because I think it provides a nice mental model for moving away from uh, pre-configured static controls and towards responding and adapting to real-time stimuli. Now let's talk about another simple and well-understood control, back off. We will start with another very simple, probably naive implementation and work towards making it adaptive. Here, the writer service is configured to sleep some amount of time if the number of failures over a period of time is greater than a threshold. The idea here is that by slowing down the service, by making it sleep before it picks the next message from Kafka, we are giving the downstream some opportunity to recover. This is super simple, but it has the same problems that our simple circuit breaker had when we were running this at scale. But now we know how to adapt to traffic size. So let's modify the sleep logic to sleep not when we exceed a configurable amount of failures over a period of time, but when a percentage failure rate exceeds a business-driven threshold. Now thanks to the simple update, we are adapting to traffic size. But can we do better than this? I think we can. Let's try and make it adaptive to traffic shape, especially feedback shape from the downstream. Here we introduce a couple of components into our architecture. First, we have a component called error reactor, which provides weights for each kind of failure mode that the service might encounter, and also associates a default or respective weight for success mode as well. It also defines, a, a, like I said, like in a, a weights for each, uh, each successful acknowledgement. Second, 
we have a, a throttle controller that observes the results from the processor and calculates a simple exponential weighted average over the weights that are obtained from error reactor and applies, that, uh, applies this decay over the time that we're going to sleep. This gives us the ability to back off not only based on size, as we were doing with our percentage threshold, but we are also enforcing varying levels of aggressiveness in our back-off strategy. Let's take an example and see how this could work. Let's say we want to back off uh, just a little when we slightly exceed our latency SLA. Let's say we want to back off uh, a bit more when we observe timeouts and back off a lot when the downstream is overloaded. So all we need to do in this case is define these failure modes into your error reactor and provide them to your service, and the throttler will just apply that for you. And here, the recovery will be driven by the amount of success messages by associating a weight to each success message that the processor might process. Before we move on to our next control, I think it is important to understand when backoff works. So when does backoff work? Is it enough by itself? Can it prevent overload and cascading failures? I think the short answer, in my opinion, is no. Mark Brooker, in his amazing blog post, captures this idea very well. He wrote, and I quote, the only way to deal with long-term overload is to reduce load. Differing load does not work. And back-off is valuable only when, and I quote again, it reduces total work. He also explained how good retry strategy, along with back-off and jitter, can help. It's an excellent blog, and I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. However, I would like to emphasize on reduced total work here, because I think it's a nice segue into our next control, concurrency. Let's zoom into the writer service from the reference architecture. Each writer service instance here is a Kafka consumer, and it has multiple Kafka workers, basically a worker pool. This worker count is configurable as well. We configure this to a predetermined number when we deploy a new version of the service and also update this from time to time as per need. Now let's go through some scenarios to understand the challenges with having a predetermined fixed number of workers in our worker pool. In this scenario, the Kafka topic is empty and the workers are not doing any work other than busy polling Kafka to check if there is any new work that is available in Kafka. So by running the same amount of workers when we doesn't really have any work to do, we are potentially just wasting CPU cycles here. Now say we have some traffic, and the da downstream data store is healthy, and consumer is performing well. But since we are running the same number of workers all the time, Maybe we are missing an opportunity here. Maybe we can run more workers and process much more efficiently, but we are not utilizing our full capacity here. And finally, let's say that if the downstream is experiencing some sort of performance degradence. But given that the worker pool size remains static all the time, regardless of the feedback from downstream systems, we could eventually overload downstream. And this could push our system into cascading failures. Surely, back-off strategies would help here. But is back-off alone sufficient? How is it related to the concurrency of our system? Before we answer that, let's take a detour and explore queuing theory. I would like to talk about Little's law in particular. Little's law is a theorem that determines the average number of items in a system based on the average waiting time of an item within that system and the average number of items arriving at that system per unit of time. Now let's see if we can apply the principles from Little's Law to model the processing capacity of our writer service. I think now we can clearly see the number of workers is synonymous to the arrival rate from Little's Law, as the number of workers influence the amount of work that is coming into the system. I mentioned a couple of slides ago that backing off can help uh, in the case of overloaded system. But now, thanks to Little's Law, we are able to see how that is related to concurrency of our system. This illustration, I think, helps us come up with a mental model to understand the interplay between back-off and concurrency in our system, and how together they can influence the total capacity. 
Let's say if our back-off strategy is to sleep for some time before picking the next message from Kafka, backing off is going to increase the average processing time. And the concurrency of the system, number of workers in our example, can influence the arrival rate of messages. And together, they can influence the total capacity. If you are following closely, you will identify that the underlying theme that I'm trying to capture here is capacity is not a constant. Capacity of your services downstream might change over time. And hence, there is need to change the processing capacity of your service at real time. Concurrency combined with appropriate back of strategies is a great way to do that. So if the capacity doesn't remain constant, how do we estimate the right number of workers in our worker pool? Not only is that it is hard to estimate, but I think it would be an operational nightmare if we were to keep estimating this and update configuration periodically. Instead, we can infer this based on the feedback from the downstream system and change this dynamically in real time within permissible bounds. The beauty of this is that the ideal capacity doesn't need to remain constant. As the ideal capacity changes, the feedback from the downstream system changes. And when we adapt accordingly, we will eventually converge with the ideal capacity. There are many strategies using which we can adaptively change the concurrency of our services. Majority of this uh, adaptive capacity management theory took its shape in TCP condition control. We wanted to start with the simplest of all, uh, implement it and put it in production and see if it really helps. So we picked AIMD. The additive increase multiple multiplicative decrease algorithm is a feedback control algorithm best known for its use in TCP congestion control. AIMD basically combines the linear growth of congestion window when there is no congestion, congestion uh, with an exponential reduction when congestion is observed. In our scenario, we can model congestion using the right timeouts to our Cassandra data store. This is a graph uh, that I captured from one of our production systems. Here we can see adaptive concurrency in action. As the Kafka topic is receiving more traffic, we see adaptive concurrency control or increasing the number of workers in the worker pool of the writer service to match the demand. And once the lag was consumed, when there is no more work, the worker count was reduced to near minimum levels automatically to save CPU cycles. Unreduced wastage, of course. This is another example where adaptive concurrency was a real game changer for us. As opposed to previous example, the number of workers have not increased initially here, even when there is more work coming into the Kafka topic. This is because the adapter controller noticed the elevated latency from Cassandra and responded to that feedback and avoided overloading the system. When the latency was down to normal ranges, it automatically increased the number of workers to bring the processing pipeline up to date. All of this happened in real time without any manual intervention, without any alerts, and no incidents. Now let's take a look at rate limiting. We will use the reader service from our reference architecture to help put things into perspective. Traditionally, rate limiting is done through central coordination using a fast in-memory data store like Redis or Memcache, et cetera, to host the rate limiting configuration. Clients make requests to readers, and readers, upon receiving this request, will check this central store and to make a decision whether to allow this reject or I love this request or to reject this request. Also, it is not un uncommon to use a local in-memory store in the reader containers that periodically gets updated based on the configuration values that we have in the central store. It, it, it kind of prevents the single point of failure that we have in the other model, but still it has some flaws. Both of these designs require centralized coordination and have single point of failures, especially when the central store is down for extended periods of time. Even if we ignore the coordination problem, there are still some shortcomings with traditional rate limiting. Let's go through a few scenarios and explore what they are. The first scenario is as follows. Say we have three clients, A, B, and C. 
And the request rate allocation is 10 requests per second to A, 25 to B, and 5 to C. Let's say if one reader container at any given point in time can serve 100 requests per second. With this allocation strategy, we are only using 40, even with peak usage. And especially when the clients are internal, we are unnecessarily rate limiting clients, when we can process more, of, more requests from them. So we are essentially wasting capacity here. Now let's take a look at scenario where the reader API container, say for example, scheduled on a busy C, uh, Kubernetes node and is getting CPU throttled quite heavily. The total capacity in this scenario will not be 100 requests per second, and say it is just 20 requests per second now because of the performance degradants, uh, and the container is unable to get any CPU time from the node. But with a static configuration for our clients, A, B, and C, we are still going to allow 40 requests to come into the system. This will lead to resource exhaustion and eventually lead to latency spikes, memory leaks, and all beautiful sorts of errors that we all SREs love. Finally, in this scenario, we challenge the fundamental assumption that we can guarantee that we process 10 requests from A, 25 requests from B, and five requests from C. For example, when Cassandra is exhibiting downgraded performance, we won't be able to serve that number of requests. But clients A, B, and C will keep making these requests, and these requests won't get rejected because they're within their limits, and it gets really bad from there. Without load shedding, we will eventually end up with cascading failures. So how can we improve upon this? Following the theme of the talk, we respect that the capacity doesn't remain constant and adapt to its changes. Let's see if we can do that with respect to our rate limiting. The idea here is instead of allocating A with 10 requests per second and uh, B with 25 and whatnot, what if we allocate A with 25% based on the math that is shown on the slide? And if we do similar allocations for B and C, we will have the following uh, capacity allocation. But what about T here, the total capacity of the reader container? How do we estimate that? It is simple. We do not estimate that. We infer that from the system. This is the same approach that we took for determining the number of workers that our worker pool should run in our writer service. We start with a seed value and minimum and maximum bounds, and we let the algorithm converge around the ideal value for T by adapting to the feedback from downstream. This adaptive rate limiting system requires no manual work, requires no centralized coordination, easy to compute, and will not steal resources from your service, infers capacity limits without any hardware or system topology awareness, will adapt to changes in processing capacity at runtime. Next up is auto-scaling. Traditionally, auto-scaling is based upon resource utilization metrics like CPU or memory, or external metrics like incoming requests that are coming into your system or the amount of lag uh, on your Kafka consumer, etc. This usually works great for stateless services or services without any real downstream dependencies. But the issue with that auto-scaling system is uh, what I'd like to call an, uh, it, it is an open system. It only takes the load that is coming into the account and doesn't necessarily respect the feedback that is coming from the downstream system. And that is problematic because it could lead to potentially overloading downstream systems when it shouldn't. In this example, when we have Kafka consumer group lag based auto scaling strategy for the writer service, just because there is more traffic coming into the system, even though Cassandra cannot support it, your autoscaler will just keep adding more pods until it hits the maximum limit. And this will only cause problems by putting your system under pressure and potentially leading to overload. I know this slide is getting you know, bored, but so how can we improve upon this? Following the theme of this talk, we respect that the capacity of the system doesn't remain constant and adapt to its changes. Let's see how we can do that with respect to auto-scaling. So let's say we are using adaptive concurrency with the following configuration. We have the maximum number of workers set to five, minimum number of workers set to two. 
and we have auto scaling rule which says scale up when the utilization is greater than 70%. And when I say utilization, utilization of the worker pool for say 10 minutes. And scale down when the utilization of the worker pool is less than 50% for more than 10 minutes. Let's explore a few scenarios that will help us understand how using adaptive concurrency, we can potentially build an adaptive autoscaler. Imagine a scenario where we have two pods with three workers in it. The average capacity utilization in this scenario is 60% because we're using three out of five. And, and as per our autoscaling strategy, there is nothing to do here because we don't have to scale up or scale down here. But when the system is idle and there is no work, adapt to concurrency is going to reduce the number of workers in your pods as we have seen before. Say in this scenario, the average capacity utilization is 40%. And this should result in a scale down because it is less than the scale down threshold of 50% utilization. Now when a spike of traffic comes in, we have system lagging behind as it is under provisioned. So there is a lot of work coming into the system Controller sees this, increases the worker pool size, and we'll end up with, say, something like four workers. The capacity utilization will reach 80%, and resulting in a scale-up, because the scale-up threshold is at 70%. Now that we understand the simple math behind the adaptive capacity utilization, let's see how we could leverage that and frame an autoscaling strategy for our writer service by just looking at a hypothetical series of events. At the top of the screen, we have one pod with four workers in it. The utilization in that case is 80%, which is greater than 70% threshold, and our autoscaler will notice this and add two more pods. So now we have three pods with four workers each. Let's say that this is too many workers, and at this point we are potentially overloading Cassandra. Cassandra's performance will be degraded. We will start receiving timeouts. And the adaptive controller will observe these timeouts and reduce the number of workers in each pod to, say, two, which is the minimum. But when we run two workers, when we run these pods with two workers for more than 10 minutes, our capacity utilization will be less than 50%. And the autoscaler will scale down at this point by reducing one pod. So now we have two pods with two workers each, which gives, which gives the downstream some opportunity to recover and let's say after some time, if the downstream recovers and uh, is able to successfully serve the request, the success rate will go up. And the adaptive controller sees this opportunity and increase the worker pool size to three. So given that this is a hypothetical series of events, let's say that our system is stable here. But the idea that I'm trying to capture here is that this autoscaling system is a closed system. It respects the feedback from downstream indirectly by looking at the capacity utilization of your worker pool and adapts accordingly to drive the system forwards and uh, basically by adding more pods or backwards by reducing pods and pushing your system always to have maximum average throughput and also potentially saving quite a lot of resources. However, there is one last challenge. At the heart of this auto-scaling strategy is this concept of maximum number of workers. So how do we estimate that? We went back to academic research on system scaling to understand the best way to empirically estimate the theoretical maximum number of workers that we can support. The idea here is to establish relationship between number of workers on one hand and throughput on the other hand through experimentation under ideal conditions. And that gives us the opportunity to determine the theoretical maximum of your system. Your system might follow Amdahl's law, and you might be able to reach performance equilibrium at a certain point, or it might follow universal scalability law, and after a certain point, in fact, the performance will actually degrade when you add more workers. So there's no shortcuts here, unfortunately. We have to do empirical analysis to estimate the theoretical maximum. And based on that, we can pick a practical maximum, say 80% of your theoretical maximum, or some threshold like that. When we launched this in production for one of our large-scale deployments, we were able to achieve around 40 to 50% reduction in compute resource usage, and has resulted in significant improvements with respect to stability, and also we saved a bunch of costs. 
when we started working on this idea of building adaptive controls that respond to real-time uh, feedback, it was clear to us from the very beginning that this is going to be a marathon and not a sprint. So encouraged by the initial results that we have seen, we have put together a roadmap that my team is working on and will continue to work on in the near future. I want to share some of these plans here to give a sense of where we are heading next. We are working on improving the reactivity of our adaptive concurrency mechanism. While AIMD is simple to understand, implement, run, and has given us excellent results, there are some drawbacks with AIMD. It is essentially a loss-based congestion control algorithm. So the risk with AIMD is that it will switch to congestion avoidance by decreasing the number of uh, workers exponentially, if you still remember, only when it detects loss. And in our example, it was timeouts. Another drawback, in my opinion, for loss-based algorithms is that it will oscillate the system between full utilization and underutilization quite a bit. In our case, we restricted the amplitude of these oscillations by using minimum and maximum bounds, and also by complementing AIMD with another algorithm called slow start threshold. Nathaniel from my team presented this at uh, great detail, including all the implementation details at GopherCon this year. I encourage you to check out the talk once it is made publicly available if you're interested. On the other hand, we have delay-based control algorithms. And these algorithms react to round-trip time delay or, or a threshold being exceeded. So the advantage of delay-based algorithms is that they achieve better average throughput since they can keep the system around full utilization. We have implemented two such delay-based algorithms. And uh, I, I've just drawn a visual representation of one, one such algorithm, which is TCP Vegas. And the idea with the Vegas is very similar, very simple. Uh, at the end of each sampling window, it will try to increase the limit by one, the worker pool size by one. If the queue or like the pending work in the system is less than a particular alpha configurable, or decrease by one if it is greater than a beta configurable. We are experimenting with this right now to determine the sensible values for both alpha and beta for our use cases at our scale. And we are planning to deploy this in production very, very soon. Remember this adaptive rate limiting strategy we discussed before? It works amazingly well when the reader API has one downstream dependency, like a single database cluster, for example. It is both fair and greedy when it is appropriate and helps improve the overall throughput. But uh, this system actually has pretty significant drawback. Now imagine if the reader API is communicating with a sharded data store. For the sake of simplicity, let's say we have three clients, A, B, and C, and they make requests over specific key ranges that are distributed over this sharded data store. The adaptive rate limiting algorithm will still work nicely as long as the, all the downstream shards are either healthy or all unhealthy at the same time. And if one of the shards is overloaded or underperforming for whatever reason, the adaptive rate limiting algorithm will respond to that feedback and bring down the total capacity of the problem. Now this is a bad, this is, this is a bad symptom because uh, in this example, even though client A never makes any request to say shard B, uh, it will still lose its allocated capacity because the algorithm is trying to bring down the total capacity of the system. And we are clearly rejecting requests in this uh, example when we shouldn't. So this could potentially lead to underutilization. We are working on an improved uh, adaptive rate limiter, which will fix this problem for systems that represent uh, this model. So the idea that we are exploring right now is uh, using probabilistic data structures like count min sketch and partition this limit over various dimensions. We, we, we are hoping to publish our work once we validate it. Before I conclude, I want to introduce one another use case that is slightly outside of this resiliency domain and more into performance or efficiency domain, if you like, uh, for this dynamic uh, adaptive controls. And it is uh, cache, manage cache management. I think no single statically configured cache management policy would yield the best results for 
any workload of any cache size. And finding the best policy of a given system requires carefully understanding various uh, characteristics of the workload and tuning your cache policy for that. But expecting our developers to do this again and again for every single cache uh, that we might employ, uh, deploy in any service might, might be a daunting task and probably we can apply adaptive controls there. So the idea that we are exploring right now is how about uh, we ad uh, apply a adaptive dynamic cache management policy where we look at the re recency and frequency bias of our workload and adapt to that by changing the cache strategy accordingly. There is uh, excellent academic research out there on this topic. If you are interested, I'll, I'll encourage you to check it out. But I just, I just wanted to include this topic in my talk because I, 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 I want to help motivate that this adaptive controls idea might apply for many, many domains and not just resiliency controls. To summarize what we have discussed today, we can adapt to feedback from downstream systems and change the concurrency processing, to concurrency or processing capacity of our system dynamically. We can utilize relative capacity thresholds instead of static rate limits, and probably we can do admission management instead of rate limiting. We can make closed loop auto scaling decisions based on adaptive control metrics. Combined, these strategies help increase the service resiliency. I hope I've given you enough motivation to move away from static controls and start working towards uh, dynamic and adaptive controls that requires very little manual intervention. If you want to work on uh, awesome distributed computing challenges like this, check out our careers page or come talk to myself or my colleague, well, my boss, Eric here. <laughs> Thank you.